for the floor to Björn Reitenberg. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction. So, um, well, hello everyone. Uh, it's really great to be here. This is my first time at uh, the Dutch Design Week, so um, it's an incredible honor that I can share my research here with you. Um, well, my name is Björn Ruitenberg. I'm a security researcher, mainly interested in hardware and firmware security, sandboxing, and uh, virtualization. I'm also a master's student in uh, computer science at TU Eindhoven, and the work that I'll be presenting today is uh, part of my master's thesis. So um, the talk that I will be giving tonight is mainly a high-level overview on uh, ThunderSpy, but in case you're interested in some of the more technical details, uh, please have a look at my Black Hat talk um, or the vulnerability report uh, published on our website. So let's talk about uh, Thunderbolt. Well, Thunderbolt is a high-performance proprietary I.O. protocol developed in 2011 by Intel and Apple. And, um, well, it's uh, PCI Express based and uh, the devices have possessed what is called direct memory access. I will go into these terms in just a little bit. But uh, for now, um, well, you could say that uh, based on these technologies, um, this Thunderbolt is really the first technology that allows uh, use cases such as connecting external graphics to a laptop, 5K monitors um, accessing um, external storage at its maximum speed. And, well, basically the first two versions, uh, they were mostly exclusive to Macs, uh, using the mini port, uh, display port form factor, and Thunderbolt th uh, 3 is the first version to be widely adopted among both PCs and Macs. Um, the main difference between the two versions is that Thunderbolt 1 and 2 use the mini-display port form factor, and since Thunderbolt 3, um, the USB-C form factor, and thereby, aside from accepting Thunderbolt devices, also a display port and USB. So, I already mentioned it, PCI Express. Um, essentially, PCI Express is the core technology that connects your CPU to your internal devices. So, for example, graphics cards, uh, Wi-Fi, and USB. Now, um, uh, the essence to PCI Express is that it heavily relies on a concept called direct memory access. And this is a very powerful concept in the sense that it allows devices to directly write the requested data into system memory. Now, from a user perspective, this is really uh, perfect because it allows high performance. Um, but from a security perspective, it's, uh, well, it could pose a security risk. And this was actually the case with Thunderbolt 1. So for Thunderbolt 1, all the attacker had to do was uh, plug in the device, and then it would immediately get unrestricted read and write memory access. Um, and as a result, they could access data from encrypted drives or install malware to gain persistent access. Now, DMA attacks are generally well understood. It first started with um, uh, the FireWire interface back in 2004, and uh, gradually moved all the way, uh, gradually moved to PCI Express all the way to the today, including all its form factors, M2, Express Card, and eventually Thunderbolt, what we'll be talking about today. So when Hollywood wants to show you what a hacker looks like, uh, this is the picture that they will typically show you. But what you should be actually watching out for is a person looking like this. Well, the person in the background, of course. Now, this has a historic reason. Um, so in the information security community, uh, when we refer to a scenario of, of brief physical access to a system, we typically call it an evil made attack. So that is the threat model that we'll be using tonight. And well, some of the uh, real world scenarios that you can think of are laptops sitting in a hotel room uh, set to sleep or they've been locked, or desktop systems um, sitting in an office. And at some crew, at some time, uh, some point in time, the cleaning crew comes in and has brief physical access. 
Now, these are typical cases um, uh, of, uh, well, where there could be um, uh, corporate or governmental espionage. So over the years, the industry has uh, implemented several protection measures against what is called opportunistic physical access. So let's just briefly go, go through them. Uh, the first one is really simple. Uh, you put a, a password on your BIOS so that if an attacker gets a hold of your laptop, they cannot enter the BIOS and modify any system settings. Now, the second one is called Secure Boot, and Secure Boot essentially cryptographically verifies all the components uh, right from the moment that you start your laptop. So, starting from the OS bootloader all the way to the operating system kernel and the device drivers. There's Boot Guard, which focuses on uh, verifying the BIOS itself. And finally, there's Full Disk Encryption. Well, Full Disk Encryption, um, if you enable this, then basically if an attacker gets a hold of your laptop and disassembles the uh, hard drive, then um, well, they still wouldn't be able to read the data unless they got the correct password. Now, Thunderbolt, uh, in terms of Thunderbolt, uh, Intel implemented a security scheme called security levels. And uh, security levels are intended to protect the entire thing that you see right here. Right, so let's dive a little bit deeper into the uh, Thunderbolt security architecture. Uh, security levels, it's really an access control system. And uh, well, for example, we have a Thunderbolt powered hard drive and we attach it to our laptop. Basically what will then happen is, um, well, the laptop will ask the user to uh, verify um, uh, what the device is, so the identity of the device, and then the user will be able to decide whether or not to authorize the device to connect to the laptop. Now, at some point, the user will agree, and from that moment on, uh, when connecting that same uh, hard drive, uh, the user will not be prompted again, but the hard drive will um, immediately start working from that point on. So this security architecture relies on uh, Thunderbolt devices um, uh, authenticating to the host. And they do that using all the parameters that you see on this slide. But the most important one is the universally unique ID, or UUID. Now, this number is intended to, uh, well, like the name says, identify any uh, single Thunderbolt device in the world. And it's also defined to be fused in silicon, so it shouldn't be easy to change. Right, so the Thunderbolt security levels. As a user, you can select any of these in the BIOS. Uh, so let's uh, quickly go through them. Um, so the first one, SL0, means no security. It's basically the same situation as with Thunderbolt 1. There's SL1, where uh, device authorization is based on the UUID only. SL2 is uh, similar to SL1, but it adds what Intel calls cryptographic um, device authentication. SL3 disables Thunderbolt entirely, but still accepts USB and DisplayPort devices. SL4 is intended for use with Thunderbolt docks. So when you attach a Thunderbolt dock, you cannot daisy chain any additional devices through that dock. And uh, finally, well, if you use either SL1 or SL2, you get pre-boot protection for free. So that means when you turn on the laptop, you can immediately use all the Thunderbolt devices that you've previously authorized, and um, all the other devices will be rejected. Now, security levels are mostly known for protecting against uh, a type of attack which is called device-to-host DMA attack. But since it prevents Thunderbolt devices from accessing the PCIe bus, it protects against a whole lot of other PCIe inherent attacks factors as well. Now, um, I won't be going into these attacks specifically in this talk, but rest assured that security levels is really a powerful and much needed uh, protection scheme. 
Right, so previous research um, before security levels mainly focused on attacking the system uh, on the PCIe level. After the introduction of security levels, uh, it mostly focused on tricking the user into accepting malicious Thunderbolt devices as being legitimate ones. Now, ThunderSpy is a new class of vulnerabilities, um, really breaking Thunderbolt security. And, uh, well, it's the first attack on the security levels. So what we're presenting today is actually seven vulnerabilities and nine um, practical ways to exploit them. Right, so um, the first step we did in our research was trying to find out how Thunderbolt works. And, uh, well, Thunderbolt is a proprietary standard. So when you try to look up protocol specifications, you will not find them. And when you try to find diagrams that will tell you what the hardware architecture is like, you will not find that either. So the first step that we did in our research is basically just dissecting various Thunderbolt devices and uh, Thunderbolt equipped systems. So let's have a look at some uh, Thunderbolt devices. Uh, they were, uh, we had a look at various Thunderbolt devices, um, starting from very simple ones like this. Uh, ISADA to Thunderbolt dongle in the middle, to storage devices, to uh, docking stations, um, and eventually external graphics cards. In essence, they were all really the same, but this net store enclosure had a really nice, clean PCB layout, so that's why I'm showing it right here. Um, our prime suspect is, in the top left corner, the Thunderbolt controller. They are a third-party chip. Um, intended for USB power delivery, and um, well, there's one for each Thunderbolt port. There's a spy flash that we'll be talking about a lot more later, um, and two very interesting ports. One is I2C. Well, if you have an electronics background, you probably know what that means. Uh, we could get some information from it, and there's an interface which is well, which looks like JTAG. But to answer your question, no, it doesn't work, sorry. So the Thunderbolt controller, well, this is a very uh, special model. Um, it supports both host and endpoint mode, and it's from the so-called Alpine Ridge generation. So it supports DisplayPoint 1.2, HDMI 2.0, uh, USB 3.1, and USB power delivery. Um, now, in terms of analyzing how the system works, uh, this particular chip is not very attractive to have a look at, at least initially, uh, because it's a BGA package, so all the paths are uh, on the bottom, and there are no public data sheets. So, um, yeah, we had a look at uh, the other chips first. So the TPS, it's really the inverse situation. There's a public data sheet. And you can actually talk to this thing over I2C. So um, requesting firmware identifiers, uh, you can request the operational state. Um, and I even found some registers that I think allow you to control the output voltage. So who knows what you could do with that. Um, there is a spy flash, which we'll be talking a lot more later. Or actually right now, because we dumped its content. And it uh, turns out that it contains the Thunderbolt con 3 controller firmware. Now, when you have a look at this firmware, um, you will immediately notice a section called the DROM. Now, the DROM stores all the parameters that you see right here. And uh, well, likely we discussed earlier, these parameters actually determine the Thunderbolt device identity. Now, of course, um, the most interesting question would be, is the UUID in there? The answer is yes, but only two out of eight bytes. Still, we would like to know if there is a cryptographic signature. And if so, uh, if we could change any of these parameters without breaking that signature. Well, to answer the first question, yes, there is a signature. Uh, there's a public key and there's a signed digest, but we cannot really change the public key because then the system doesn't work, so probably the fingerprint is likely stored somewhere in silicon. Um, but that doesn't answer a second question. So what is covered by the cryptographic signature? 
Well, not the DROM. Basically, we, uh, we found a way to, complete, uh, to make completely arbitrary Thunderbolt device identities, like the one shown here. Uh, right, this is a device made by the vendor, totally legitimate. Well, that makes no sense, of course. Um, and uh, what's more interesting is that, uh, well, all these uh, parameters right here, you would somehow expect them to be linked to each other. So, for example, you would expect the vendor ID to be tied to a certain vendor name and the other way around. And, uh, well, we found during our research that is clearly not the case because you can enter arbitrary values for both. Right, so I had another look at the um, uh, Intel white paper on uh, Thunderbolt security, and there was this interesting section on the unique ID. And it said, um, and I'm reading off the screen here, every Thunderbolt 3 controller has a unique ID fused in silicon during production. Well, we know the statement is not true because we can change two out of eight bytes, but there was this interesting emphasis on Thunderbolt 3. So I had a look at Thunderbolt 2 controller firmware. And, um, well, to answer your question, yes, this is the UUID. Yes, it's in plain text. And no, it's not covered in any signatures. What's more worrying is that we found Thunderbolt 2 devices can clone, uh, well, spoof uh, Thunderbolt 3 device identities. So what does that mean when you can clone identities? Well, remember we had this Thunderbolt powered hard drive. Um, the user had previously authorized it, but at this time uh, the laptop is locked or set to sleep. So that's all fine. I mean, the user can connect the hard drive and it will immediately start working because it had been previously authorized by the user. Now the attacker comes in and tries to connect their device. Well, of course, the attacker device will have a completely different identity. Um, and so uh, what would happen is that the system doesn't recognize this device. And, uh, well, since the laptop is locked or set to sleep, uh, the attacker can't uh, authorize that device either. Now, this is in theory how uh, Intel's protection scheme should work. But during our research, we found that we can actually clone the identities from one device to the other. Um, so essentially what this means is that the laptop will recognize the attacker device as being a legitimate user one. And it will not prompt a user, um, um, and since the laptop is locked or set to sleep, uh, that doesn't really matter. It will just connect immediately. Right, so let's have a look at some Thunderbolt equipped systems. Uh, we had a look at various systems across all, uh, well, all major vendors and um, five generations of Thunderbolt controllers, starting with Falcon Ridge on Thunderbolt 2, all the way to Ice Lake on Thunderbolt 3. Um, again, they were pretty much all the same, but this Lenovo had a really nice clean layout, so that's why I'm showing it right here. Um, if you have ever opened up a laptop, you will be familiar with most of these components. Um, but of course, uh, the most interesting ones are in the top right corner. Now, um, there's the Thunderbolt controller, like we've seen before, a little bit lower. There, there's the TPS, slightly different version uh, from what we've seen earlier. And, um, well, there's the uh, Windbond spy flash that we'll be talking about in a bit. Now first, for the host controller, there are two key questions that we wanted to answer. So, um, as a user, you can select any of these security levels that we've seen before uh, using the BIOS. And that kind of seems to imp uh, implicate that the BIOS somehow stores the security level. But I want to know whether that's actually true. Second question is, security level one and two, they require storing UUIDs of allowed devices. So we would like to know um, where is this list of allowed devices being stored. So we had a look, closer look at the host controller firmware. And uh, well, it's basically the same as device firmware, but there were a couple of important differences. 
Now the first one is basically the list of allowed devices is just there in plain text. Um, and the secure key dictionary, so when you're using SL2, um, it was, wasn't actually there. So um, that means that, or seems to suggest that, when you use SL2, um, uh, at boot time, still authentication takes place based on the UID only, which uh, kind of uh, contradicts Intel's claim. Now, most importantly, we found that it also stores the host security level configuration. And, well, to answer your question again, yes, it's there in plain text, and no, it's not part of any signatures. So, well, what can an attacker do? Um, well, basically what they have, uh, would have to do is reprogram the uh, Thunderbolt controller using standard off-the-shelf uh, spy programmer, and then what they would able be, uh, be able to do is disable Thunderbolt security entirely or restore Thunderbolt security when it was disabled. Spy flashes, I've uh, uh, well talked about them uh, quite a few times. They are very interesting devices, um, and in many cases they support some kind of write protection. Well, this particular wind bond we found in a lot of Thunderbolt uh, devices and systems, and well, it supports five different methods of write protection. There's one in there called one-time program, which is really interesting. If you activate the one-time program feature, essentially what it will do is turn the spy flash into a read-only memory. So none of its content can be changed afterwards. Now in the footnote it says special order, but we found that um, quite a number of samples that we had access to still support this kind of feature. So that's how we got to the next vulnerability, because what the attacker could do is First, use the previous attack to disable Thunderbolt security entirely, and then use the last attack to make it permanent. So from that point on, uh, the user could never turn on Thunderbolt security ever again. So to summarize, uh, Thunder Spy basically comprises two attack methods. Uh, the first one requires brief access to the victim system to reprogram the controller firmware. This takes only five minutes. Uh, it does not require access to any of the uh, victim's devices. The second method is kind of the inverse, so um, you don't need access to, uh, well, you don't need to reprogram the host controller firmware, and you only need brief access to one of the victim's Thunderbolt devices. The impact is really the same for both, so you get unrestricted read and write memory access. Uh, you can access um, data from encrypted drives, and you can gain uh, persistent access by, well, using the Thunder Spy attack to permanently disable Thunderbolt security, or you could install a rootkit. Right, so let's have a look at a demo um, where we show how an attacker could use attack method one in practice. So what we have here is a Lenovo P1, which was purchased last year. And as you can see, it's in sleep mode. Yes, it's been locked, so um, I don't know the password. And the password isn't empty either, as you can see. So that's all good. What we're going to do now is turn over the laptop so that we can reach the backplate. And we unscrew the backplate. Right, there we go. So now I'm going to attach my spy programmer, which is a device called Bus Pirate. And it allows me to interface with the spy flash that is storing the uh, Thunderbolt controller firmware. So attaching the Bus Pirate to my attacker laptop. And now we're going to use a tool called Flash ROM to get the firmware from the spy flash. Right, so now I have a dump and I'm going to feed that dump to a tool that I wrote which is called Thunderbolt Controller Firmware Patcher. And so as you can see, apparently the Thunderbolt Controller was set to security level 1, which is the default security level on all Thunderbolt laptops. 
and I'm patching it now to an insecure state. And uh, so as you can see, it says SL0, which means all Thunderbolt security is disabled. Now we're going to write back the firmware to the spy flash. Now this might take a bit because Flash ROM will be trying um, various methods to program the spy flash. And as you can see, eventually it will succeed. Okay, so um, now we've written our custom firmware to the spy flash and we're detaching the spy programmer and uh, putting back the backplate onto the laptop. <coughs> Turning over the laptop and uh, opening it up. Now, as you can see, it's uh, still up and running. You still can get into the laptop. Um, and here I'm attaching my Thunderbolt-based attack device. Now what you see here is a device that will be attacking the uh, laptop and we're going to use that device with a DMA attack tool called PCI Leech developed by Ulfrisk. And here I'm uh, loading a uh, kernel module into the memory of the laptop which allows me to bypass Windows lock screen. We're entering no password, and there we go. We can get into the laptop. Right, so if you're feeling adventurous, uh, you can try this yourself. Um, so uh, the tools that you saw in the demo, I've published them on my GitHub repo. First one, Thunderbolt Controller Firmware Patcher. Um, the second one is called SpyBlock, which lets you configure the on-flash write protection. So let's quickly move on to the affected systems. All Thunderbolt equipped systems released between 2011 and today are vulnerable. And this especially applies to PCs released between 2011 and 2018. All Macs running Windows and Linux um, are fully vulnerable as well. Now some systems released since last year, so since 2019, they provide this new feature called kernel DMA protection, which we'll be talking about in a bit, um, and they are partially vulnerable. If you're using macOS, uh, please keep doing so because they are partially vulnerable as well. Now if you would like to know whether your system is vulnerable, you can use um, our tools, SpyCheck, or you can just follow the uh, manual verification steps on our website. Right, so kernel DMA protection. Um, this was Intel's answer to ThunderSpy, which is what's kind of underwhelming. Um, well, kernel DMA protection, basically what it does is limit the memory range that Thunderbolt devices can access using a hardware component called the IOMMU. And according to Intel, all you need is an up-to-date system with Windows 10 or a recent version of the Linux kernel. So all in all, that so kind of sounds okay, but well, what they didn't tell you is that it's only a partial mitigation. So um, uh, the vulnerabilities uh, 4 to 6 are mitigated, but um, uh, spy vulnerabilities 1 to 3 are not. So yes, it does prevent attacks via DMA, but it, it still exposes the system to other kinds of attacks which are commonly known as bad USB. So, well, it requires this hardware component, the IOMMU, uh, but it also requires BIOS support, and during our research we found that this BIOS support is only present on some systems released since last year. And all the other systems, um, well, they do not have this kind of support. So essentially what Intel is saying, well, just buy a new laptop. And, uh, well, that really didn't make sense to me because that means that they are leaving about nine years worth of systems out in the cold. 
but also uh, most of these older systems feature this hardware component called the IOMMU. So technically they are capable of providing this new, well, new protection called kernel EMA protection. And so what we did is um, developing our own patch called ThunderSpy2, which is not an attack but an experimental protection. Um, it brings kernel email protection to roughly wor uh, six years worth of systems. And the good news is it works for both Windows 10 and Linux. Um, please do not use it in production yet. We're still um, working on development. But if you uh, would like to leave any feedback, you will be more than welcome. Um, Linux users will soon have a second option as well because we're win uh, working with the Linux kernel hardware security team to develop kernel level mitigations. So what's next for the future of Thunderbolt interconnects? Well, um, two issues remain unaddressed. First, uh, there are these three ThunderSpy vulnerabilities. There are to really for a user no means to distinguish uh, for a certain device between um, uh, tempered uh, DROMs and legitimate DROMs. So physically, the device could look okay, but internally it could still be malicious. Now, Intel introduced kernel DMA protection as a replacement for security levels, but a side effect of kernel DMA protection is that when you attach a device, it will immediately get um, Thunderbolt connectivity without asking the user. So, um, well, it does prevent DMA attacks, but since it connects to the device immediately, it does not protect against other uh, PCIe inherent uh, attack factors. So yeah, these are really important issues to have a look at. And um, uh, well, for USB 4 and Thunderbolt 4, which are upcoming technologies, um, basically um, there, are, there are a number of issues. First of all, for Thunderbolt 4, we now know that Intel um, requires kernel EMA protection as part of their product certification program. Um, and, uh, well, the other one is that backwards compatibility still likely means susceptibility to both of the issues that we mentioned here. Right, so the takeaway that I would like to give you is uh, ThunderSpy is really a new class of vulnerabilities, uh, breaking Thunderbolt security. There is no fix from Intel, so really check if your system is vulnerable using either spy check or um, verifying manually. Um, if you would like to know more about the technical details, have a look at uh, our Black Hat talk or the vulnerability reports published on our website. Um, there's ThunderSpy 2, it's not an attack but an experimental uh, patch, which really shows that older systems that have an IOMMU would still be capable of providing this new kernel DMA protection. And finally, well, whether you like it or not, the future is PCI Express. Um, so this allows really nice use cases, but um, well, as we've seen here, there are numbers of issues that still remain unaddressed. So I hope that when USB 4 and Thunderbolt 4 end up in consumer products, uh, they will be addressed at that time. So that's it for today. Um, thank you for joining. And if you have any questions, you can reach me on Twitter or ask me here in the Q&A. Thank you. Bjorn, thank you so much. You're really the master of this, uh, this kind of uh, information. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot. You're an expert. I uh, grasped uh, quite a few, of, quite a bit of it, but not, not, not exactly everything. So I'm happy I don't have to pass my exam next week uh, based on this score. So, but um, there are maybe some related questions when it comes to hacking uh, systems, uh, more society-related uh, uh, questions. Although uh, what you're you, what you're saying is also very relevant, especially in the, in the specialized world of uh, computer scientists. But we had the case of the Maastricht uh, University being hacked. Um, what is your advice for universities in order to prevent hacks like that? Well, uh, the uni uh, University of Maastricht hack was, of course, very different to uh, the kind of attacks yeah, that are shown here. Yeah, I, I understand. Um, yeah. But, uh, well, basically, network monitoring is very important when it comes to ransomware attacks, which is the kind of attack that uh, Maastricht had to deal with. Mm -hmm. And backups. Basically, yeah. if you have those two 
Um, if you have programs in place that uh, take care of those two, then it should be go, well, I wouldn't say you can guarantee that it will not happen, but um, at least you have some means to get back up and running uh, very quickly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, good. I, I, I wondered what will be the, the, the issues coming up uh, in the next uh, years when you, you think of the Thunder Spy uh, uh, attacks that uh, will, will happen. What, what do you envision as uh, special hazards uh, for the coming years? So I would uh, say that for the average user, um, this might not be a particular way of, uh, well, a particular method that uh, attackers would use to attack them. There are other much easier ways like phishing, for example. Mm -hmm. But uh, more high value targets like, um, uh, well, people in, in companies in higher positions or governmental positions, uh, they, these are usually targets of this kind of attacks. And so if you have a Thunderbolt port and you have a laptop uh, before 2019, I would strongly advise you to, uh, well, get a new one <laughs> or get one without a Thunderbolt port. Okay. But I have a very stupid, maybe daft question. Uh, but what I saw in, in the movie is that you really have to screw, op screw, the, uh, screw open the, the, uh, in order to, to attack it. This, mm -hmm. it in that sense, it's not possible to do that without... Uh, actually physically uh, uh, enter the, uh, the laptop. Is, is that true? Um, well, there are two attack methods. So yeah. what I've shown in the demo is uh, one where you just only need the laptop. Yeah. And so indeed you unscrew the backplate yeah. and you attach a, well, what's called a spy programmer. You yeah. use my tool to reprogram the security mm -hmm. yeah. to disable it completely. Yeah. Then you reattach the backplate mm -hmm. and then, well, basically you can You're enter without entering any password. Yeah. The second attack method does not require disassembling the laptop at all. Basically what you would need is access to one of the victim's pre-authorized Thunderbolt devices. Uh -huh. So you can imagine that if you're in a hotel room um, and there's this laptop, there might be a hard drive, a Thunderbolt hard drive, or something as simple as a Thunderbolt dongle to well, that gives you HDMI output mm -hmm. uh, together in the back with the laptop. So what the attacker would have to do is just take that device, copy its identity, and then uh, that would be enough to gain access to the laptop yeah. as well. That's uh, the really tricky one. Yeah, okay. Thanks a lot, Björn. Uh, I guess we have to conclude the evening. Uh, thank you very much for your explanation about this very uh, adventurous uh, subject, uh, very relevant for the, computer of, uh, for the future of computer science and all the related uh, tasks that we have to, to do as, uh, as human beings. So thanks for being with us.